I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll, please. All right, call the roll, please. Trustee Sperling. Here. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Hines. Here. Trustee Youngerman. Yeah. Trustee Marisek. Yeah. Trustee Bond. Here. Mm-hmm. All right, we're all here. Uh, moving on, public participation. Any member of the public? Two minutes. All right. Moving on to consent. We have uh, one item, cancel canceling of the tw uh, May 23rd board meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Roll, please. Trustee Bond. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Hines. Yay. Trustee Marisek. Whoops, sorry, Trustee Youngerman. <laughs> and Trustee Marisek. Yes. I'm new at this. <laughs> All right, that carries unanimously. Moving on for uh, items for separate action, we have a grant of easement at 1690 Douglas Road for Ice House USA. That'll ask uh, Director Young for a summary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, at your station tonight, there is an aerial photo that shows. Um, the property that includes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 1690 Douglas Road. This is the site that you've uh, recently approved for the Ice House America uh, operation. What this is about is the need for a ComEd uh, easement <clears throat> to service the property from a um, substation or a um, transformer that is just south of the drive that's located within the village property. And I should have mentioned all of the village property is outlined in red. You see the hashed area, that's the potential easement location. We don't have it exactly pinpointed, but we'd like to ask for your approval subject to uh, engineering review and village attorney uh, documentation. I have a question if I may, and it's not even really related to that. Um, where it says village owned parcel, that's not actually owned by the village. It's incorporated within the village, correct? No, it's owned by the village. Is that portion owned by the village? Okay, I wasn't aware. Thank you. Yes. Any questions for staff on an easement for electrical service? Is since, there? Since we're not meeting next week, this helps them out to get started with their combat service needs. There appears to be the beginnings of a roadway here where this might be located. Is it's more it of a driveway, but uh, essentially it is potentially an additional roadway in the future. Um, there's already an existing easement adjacent to it to the west. You can barely see it, but there's two black lines that would be just to the west of the hashed area. Um, that is already an existing easement, so there are utilities that cross it is a complicated area, I'll give you that, because we have a number of different utilities, both east-west and, and one that's north-south, and this would be the second one. So it's going to be, um, if there's a water main break in the future, it will be a little bit of a challenge, but um, um, this is the best way for them to get service to the property. Okay. I, I might add that we could have allowed uh, overhead lines to cross Douglas, but that was not our preference from an aesthetic standpoint. So this was the best alternative. Agreed. Is there a motion? Can we take action on this tonight? Yeah. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Bond. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yep. Trustee Hines. Yay. Trustee Youngerman. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I carry six zero. Thanks. All right. Items for discussion. We have the water system master plan presentation, and uh, we'll turn it over to uh, EEI. This evening, uh, the presentation will be done by Jeff Freeman, who's been the project lead on this project from the start, um, and he's been handling um, a number of water studies as of late, so he's very uh, current on all items relating to this. But I wanted to give a few introductory remarks before we started. 
Um, first of all, there's going to be a lot of information presented tonight, and my recommendation is to let it sink in a little bit because there's just going to be a lot of stuff, and we're not asking for any kind of action this evening, but we wanted to introduce you to the entire topic, go through it, and then uh, let it sit a little bit, and then we will follow up with subsequent meetings. So just kind of letting you know that. The second thing I wanted to mention is there's going to be a lot of acronyms that are used and abbreviations in the presentation. If something is shown that you don't understand or doesn't make sense to you, just let us know and we'll respond because it's almost impossible to be able to follow it unless you're an engineer. And even then, it's pretty difficult sometimes for me. So, uh, of course, some would argue I'm not totally an engineer. But anyway, um, so uh, there is a, at the end of the report, there is a, um, a, a schedule of the acronym so you can refer to it if you want to, uh, or the PowerPoint, I mean. So, um, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. And a, a few things to keep in mind, we're looking out into the future to the year 2050 with this report. So we're, we're going out in time. So this isn't about uh, really the people at the table today. It's about the families and the families of those families. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're thinking about this. It's not some of the things will be for today, but a lot of it is out <coughs> into the future for future generations. Um, there's a concept that's going to be introduced tonight that you've heard about, I think, in subsequent uh, pre or in, in past presentations, but uh, I just want to remind you, and it's called low water use, um, uh, low resource intensive um, water use. And what that means is it's, uh, it's we have two um, ways we express it. So current trends is how we're using water today. The low resource intensive water use would be some reduction in the water use from what we're using today. What we're observing in a lot of um, communities that we go through and look at uh, water systems is there has generally been a decline in per capita water use anyway. Um, a lot of it is because of more efficient appliances that are out there. Um, some of it is just changes in behavior. But as we go forward, it's going to be, I think, become obvious that the low resource intensive uh, water use pattern is probably going to be a huge benefit to the village and our residents. And I don't think it's going to be difficult to achieve. It's just something that we're going to have to keep in mind. So I just ask you to just pay attention to that. And that's kind of a, maybe a new concept that um, you haven't seen before. A um, couple other things. Uh, we've used for the basis for our uh, populations the CMAP projections, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. They're the regional uh, authority on population projection. So that's why we chose it. Part of this discussion tonight is, you know, the first part is going to be all about Montgomery, and then we've got a, a pretty significant uh, chapter on um, a possibility of combining forces with surrounding communities to develop a water supply system. So um, we use the same population projections methods for all three. We use the CMAP projections for everybody so there was consistency in it. I think everybody knows that population projections are, uh, you know, are not obviously, they're all, th there's no perfect population projection, but we thought that was the most authoritative, best available data. That's the reason we used it. So that's how things are based. Um, we've used that in some other similar things where we've had to uh, try to project out in the future. We tried to choose best available data so that we had um, consistency in all the cost estimates and, and all of the uh, projections that we've used. So I think with those um, opening remarks, I think I will just maybe recap the, um, yep, we'll recap the, just some of the project goals. And again, um, we started out with the goal of meeting the village's needs to the year 2040. When we met with everybody, and we have had uh, almost a year of preparation to get to this point, we've had many meetings with uh, senior staff at the village and other the other communities to talk about it. And it was agreed that the 2040 planning horizon, while it seems a long way out, if there's a major improvement that's done, it may take 10 to 15 years to implement, and you start creeping up on the end of your, your uh, planning period. So we extended it out to the year 2050 as being a reasonable planning period. So that adjustment's been made. But as you can see, we're going out into the future, and we're looking for something that's going to be sustainable for us. Um, we then evaluated all of our sources of supply, deep well, shallow, the Fox River, Lake Michigan, 
Um, we also uh, talked to the city of Aurora to see if we, we thought the fact that we connect to them uh, as a possible option. All of those were evaluated. Um, we're also going to talk about the water conservation op options, which I think is a low resource intensive future, how that saves capital and how that works. We have updated the village and distribution system model. And the distribution system model has been something that we've used um, since I've been here to help us guide uh, how large water mains need to be installed. So like in the, when we developed the western area, we used the model to predict where we needed six <coughs> inch water main or we needed eight inch water main. And that was able to uh, help us. And then we made the developers put in the appropriate size water main. So we updated it so that it's current. Um, it's now GIS based. In the past, it was working off of a more of a, oh, um, just a more uh, basic model. Now it's a, it's a GIS based model, uh, so it's current. And um, we now have used it for this study to uh, indicate where we need to add additional water main in the village over time. And that'll be part of the um, discussion on improvements that the village will need. We'll come up with a phasing and implementation plan for the required improvements over the uh, over the 2050 uh, planning period. We're going to eventually compute the connection fee. Right now, we're not in a position to do that because we need some feedback from the village board before we can finalize the report. Uh, but eventually, we'll come up with a new connection fee that can be used as we move forward for cap on fees. And lastly, and maybe this is <coughs> uh, new concept, but was the uh, initiation of a sub-regional water supply and treatment discussions with Yorkville and Oswego um, to see if there's any rationale to, to combine uh, to a three-way um, collaborative effort to see if, you know, if that's the most cost-effective way to uh, do a water supply. So we'll get into that in some detail. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and let him run with it. And um, if there are questions at any time, please interrupt. We'd like to respond as quickly as we can. If we don't have any answers, we'll get them later. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, appreciate that. So Pete just went through the goals of the study. Those were essentially the goals that we had defined in our contract, and what we'd like to show you tonight is we have, in fact, accomplished those. Uh, to give you an idea of how the presentation is structured, uh, first, we're going to talk about some background information for the Village of Montgomery, all things you're probably pretty familiar with, but just to lay that foundation, uh, talk about your existing water work system, how many wells you have, how many towers, again, laying the foundation for moving forward. After that, we'll talk about the historical water use, and then we use that information to project that water use out into the future. Uh, we do a quick little regulatory review uh, summary for you. Uh, we did go through all the regulations and confirmed that the village is meeting all the existing regulations in near future. Regulations, needs assessment calculations tell us quantity-wise how much supply we need, how much storage, et cetera, and then we can take that into further analysis. Probably the largest portion of the presentation is sustainable source water assessment, but it's very important uh, to this overall process. Uh, after that point, if I haven't totally tired you out, uh, or if you're getting there, you might want to go for a break. So if I forget as I'm burning through this and we get done with the sustainable source water assessment, uh, please remind me that that's the point where we could take a break. After that, we're going to talk briefly about the distribution system analysis that Pete mentioned, get into the sub-regional analysis. So prior to that, of course, we're building the Montgomery system more or less on their own, uh, but then after that, uh, we'll get into what it would take to work together with your neighbors, and then go through a summary of the alternatives uh, with some costs following that, and uh, just an overall discussion at the end for uh, what the decisions might be moving forward, and then what the next steps would be. So getting into uh, background, the Village of Montgomery planning area as defined on this map, it would be the outer area here that's in green with the black line uh, going through it. You have uh, boundary agreements with Aurora, uh, Oswego, Sugar Grove, and Yorkville. Your planning area in total, the total area uh, surrounding that planning area is around 15.6 square miles. Currently the corporate limits 
uh, take in about 9.3 square miles of that. Uh, obviously, Boulder Hill, which you serve with water, is inside of your planning area, but it's not inside of the corporate limits. So that would get even closer from the 9.3 up to the 15.6. Population, first looking at uh, historical population, uh, which we have the individual line. So the village is here in orange for the historical up to uh, 2010. Uh, the gray line here is Boulder Hill. Obviously, you're very familiar with the fact that the village provides water to Boulder Hill. Uh, basically, we just used 9,000 people in that subdivision um, from 1990 forward. The blue line then is the sum total of those historically, which in 2010 uh, was about 26,800 people. Projecting that forward, as Pete mentioned, with the CMAP population projection in mind, uh, takes the village up to 42,000 people. Uh, we just set that at the end of the planning period, and we'll talk a little bit later uh, about you know, some changes to the CMAP projection, actually, that occurred to get us there. Uh, the growth within the village, of course, was predominantly within 2000 to 2010, or at least in recent decades. Uh, the community was growing at about 8.6% uh, per year. When you look out into the future, this line uh, lines up with about 1.1%. Uh, obviously, Boulder Hill is flat through this period, so really when you're looking at the village's growth, it's more like 1.5, 1.6%. He did mention this concept a little bit earlier just to illustrate it in graphical form. If you take uh, the y-axis here being the peak demand on a system, and this is very general, this isn't specific to Montgomery, but if this is the peak demand and then over time, the water use might look a little something like this. So if you historically have a, a water use pattern it's established as the baseline, it's established as that current trends. If we use those water use parameters out into the future, that's how it would look. Well, the existing capacity of a system at some point likely is going to intersect where that growing water demand is. And in this case, at just above 5 MGD, out in the time frame of 2033, the capacity of the system would be uh, met and ultimately the capacity would have to be increased. So if you're choosing 2050 as your planning period, the system would be expanded to 9, 9.5 MGD to be able to meet that demand in the future. However, if the community was able to integrate a higher level of water conservation, the demand curve may look a little bit more like this. With the less resource intensive or low resource intensive water line being less here over time, now you don't hit the existing capacity of the system until about 2043-ish, 2042-ish. So you're certainly delayed on the amount of time uh, for the existing capacity of the system. And then if you're continuing to target 2050 as that planning period, because the water use actually went down, the facilities get smaller. Smaller means save money. Okay, this is a map of the Village of Montgomery's water work system. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify on the chart that shows the current trends and the less resource intensive. Yes, sir. The first red line that shows existing capacity, that reflects the water system we have in place now? That would be, this isn't specific to Montgomery. This okay. is just a very general graph that the American Water Works Association has put out. So this is conceptual. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I mean, actually, your lime softening plant is rated for 5.25 MGD. Uh, you have two other water treatment plants with that, so actually it's a little bit larger than this. What? All right. I, I was confused about what area. What, what area are we talking about? Is this a regional pr projection or...? Uh, this would just be the very general concept. So if you took Community A, could be anybody that had this sort of water use to it, and their capacity ended up being 5.5 MGD, it was just to illustrate the concept that at some point under that water demand, you would hit that capacity here, but then if you could lower the demand, it would be much 
later in the time when you would have to implement that improvement. So okay. nine years from that point, eight years from that point is actually when you exceed it. The investment that you made lasts longer and then it ends up being smaller that you have to expand it so you save money. Neither of these numbers represent Montgomery. They do not. They're just Yes, it's just a very general schematic. <clears throat> okay. Um, existing water work system, a couple main things to point out here. First of all, you have three pressure zones, which are in the three different colors. Uh, yellow, uh, the western pressure zone. Purple being the central pressure zone. And then the green being the east pressure zone. The village has nine water wells uh, throughout the community. Uh, five of them are what are called deep sandstone water wells, and we're going to drill down into that a little bit more later. Four of them are shallow groundwater wells. Two are sand and gravel, and two are limestone. The village also has a four, or excuse me, three water treatment plants. The one in the central portion of the village, so that's along Nell Road. If you can't see the map, here's the Fox River. So you have the Nell Road lime softening water treatment plant. To the east, you have the Well 8 water treatment plant, which is at the multi-leg tank uh, east of Douglas. And then out west, you have the Wells 14 and 15 cation exchange water treatment plant, which is in the northern end of the Cambridge subdivision north of Route 30. The system also has four elevated water storage tanks uh, spread out, and then the fifth star on here is a ground storage tank that's located at the lime softening water treatment plant. The system also has two booster pump stations. Uh, the booster pump stations transfer water from one pressure zone to the other uh, here and here, and then also you have a pressure reducing valve station that transfers water from high to low, so the east zone to the central zone. Just to summarize that, again, in a little more detail, nine active wells, three, four, eight, and then 10 through 15. Two of them are shallow sand and gravel, two are shallow limestone, three, we mentioned, I mentioned that there's five deep sandstone. Well, three of those are open to two of these sandstone formations, the St. Peter, which is the shallower, and the Ironton Galesville, which is deeper. And those are two terms that you're going to hear quite a bit tonight, and we're going to show you a little bit later on a schematic uh, what that means from a depth perspective. Two of your wells are in the Ironton Galesville only. The flow rate of those wells, the shallow well number 12, pumps at about 200 gallons per minute, whereas deep well number 8 pumps at 1,160. All of the deep wells exceed the radium standard. Therefore, a treatment is required. That's accomplished with lime softening at the water treatment plant along Nell Road, and then the two on the east and west ends is cation exchange. Storage, like we mentioned, um, you have two ground underground storage tanks, the 500,000, or excuse me, the million gallon ground storage tank that's at the lime softening water treatment plant, actually underneath the lime softening water treatment plant, there's a clear well that's 300,000 gallons. You have the four elevated tanks ranging in size from three quarters of a million up to two million gallons. The distribution system, all that pipe in the ground that's transferring the water across your system is four inch to 16 inch in diameter. There's the three pressure zones that we showed you uh, before. We're gonna talk about it again in a second. The two booster pump stations, pressure reducing valve. The system is uh, monitored and controlled with what's called a supervisory control and data acquisition system. Uh, all the information is collected at your local facilities and then it's transferred back wirelessly via radio uh, to a central node at the uh, water treatment plant. Uh, the guys can look on the personal computer there and operate your system uh, from that point or they can actually remotely connect into that system and see what's going on. So in the evening, if there's an alarm, if there's an issue, uh, they can actually pull it up at home and uh, typically take care of things uh, from their house. Like we mentioned, there's three pressure zones. So based on the topography of the village, the system has to be broken up into multiple pressure zones so that we can hit the standard pressure differential of 40 to 80 PSI. The low point, as I'm sure you're well aware, is the Fox River. And then the topography going to the east and to the west from there generally gets higher. So we have the west pressure zone and 
The ferrofuel weigh elevated tank establishes generally the static water pressures out in that zone. The two multi-leg tanks in the middle of town are at the same elevation and they establish the water pressure in the middle of town. And then the Ogden Hill tank uh, is set at yet another elevation to establish pressures that are consistent with the topography out there. So again, you have the 40 to 80 PSI. Because it's set up in multiple pressure zones, and this is not different than just about any other community in the area, uh, Yorkville has four, Oswego has three, um, most communities have multiple pressure zones. Water has to be transferred across those zones, though, often, and the conveyance between zone is important, and that will be important when we're talking about some of our other options, because right now you actually have supply sources in, um, across your whole system where you can pump that water immediately into that zone. It can be stored. In the situations where we're talking about bringing it to one point in your system, like the sub-regional approach, it comes in on the west side and we have to get the water all the way across to the east side and that will require some improvements which we'll summarize later. Going into water use now, um, the historical water use review was done on five years. Uh, we started this in the middle of 2015, so the five complete years that we had for that was 2010 to 2014. The, to 2014, the average gallons per capita per day, so how much on average a person uses within your system ranged from 87 to 96. The rule of thumb is 100. So uh, it's nice to see that. Yes, sir? Is that number per person or per, per residence? Person. Per person? Per person. Based on the population. So that would be okay. resident plus Boulder Hill. Now, obviously, you have commercial and industrial, so their water use is still applied across the population. And so on the west side, where there's a lot of little kids, younger population, as they become teenagers, <laughs> I'm sure the water use is just going to go up. Okay. Certainly, certainly. So with that, the average, I think, ended up being about 91 gallons per capita per day. We chose 90 to use as your current trends projection. Uh, that was consistent with Yorkville and Oswego, and because we wanted to have some level of consistency as we applied water use across the sub-regional analysis, for the current trends, we use 90. Another really important parameter is that max, max day demand, MDD, to average day demand, that's your peaking factor. So across 365 days of the year, you average the, you know, approximately 90 gallons per capita per day, but there are times of year where you have that peak water use. Most of the components within your water work system are designed to meet that peak day. We can't run out of water, right? So we gotta make sure we hit that peak day. So therefore, establishing it, this parameter at 1.75, it averages 1.4 to 1.66. When the village was experiencing more growth, that peaking factor was higher. That's pretty common. Uh, with you know, more moderate growth, it ends up being less. In a community that's pretty mature and it doesn't have much growth at all, it's usually around 1.5. So we ended up using 1.75 uh, for you guys to have a little bit of conservatism in there. Again, we can't run out of water, uh, but it is consistent generally with your historical use. The next one then is your max hour demand to maximum day demand, and that's just simply two times. Uh, you don't actually measure that, just about nobody does or can within their systems. Uh, so this is just a rule of thumb being two. Uh, that would be the, con we use that to evaluate conveyance of the water through the water mains, maybe for a fire flow demand or in that peak hour when perhaps um, folks are turning their sprinklers on or all showering at the same time. In 2014, your average day demand was 2.44 MGD and your max day demand was 3.42. If we take the population projection that we talked about earlier and we apply the 90 gallons per capita per day, your average day demand in 2050 would be about 3.8 million gallons per day. We use this peaking factor of 1.75, you're at 6.62, and then the next peaking factor of two, you're at 13.23. Now I wanna bring your attention to a couple of the exhibits or the exhibits over here. First of all, up top, uh, we have the pie distribution for your water use in FY 14-15. It's got the distribution of the incorporated residential being the highest portion of that, 
and I can't see it exactly, I think it's in the 50% range. Uh, you also have the unincorporated residential, which would be the Boulder Hill being the red there. And then you've got the, uh, excuse me, the Boulder Hills in the purple. And then you've got the industrial commercial as the other components of your uh, water use. The chart below that then uh, shows the average daily water use within each month throughout the year. The blue bar is to show the baseline water use. So in January, in general, your average day was around 2.5. We then separated out the period of time where there's outdoor water use to see exactly how much is used outdoors, typically for lawn sprinkling. Um, it's shown here as irrigation, but it could be car washing or any other portions of outdoor water use. That for the village of Montgomery is about 3.8%. That's pretty good. Uh, we've seen as high as 22% in one community that has a lot of automatic uh, lawn sprinklers. Uh, one of your neighbors is around 10%. Uh, we've seen other people in say the six to 12%. So 3.8 is good. I think overall your residents do a nice job of um, using out water outdoors that is pretty efficient. One other thing that we did with your water use was we used the AWWA as the American Water Works Association. It's a national association that sets standards. They have established a free software program to audit the water use so that you can put it in different buckets. So on the left side, it's how much you've pumped. And then from there, it distributes into the different buckets. The one, I'm not going to go through each one of these unless you really want me to. The one I really wanted to point out is the water loss within the village of Montgomery system back in um, FY14 was about 201 million gallons. So you pumped 890 million gallons and then 201 of that um, did not end up getting to a point where the water was billed. That's about 23% of how much was pumped. Now AWWA has done some benchmarking and the average is around 21%. So you're actually not too far off of that. The reality is though, it'd be nice to be lower, right? If we can keep some of that, more of that water in the mains, send it to the customers for their use, obviously get the revenue from it instead of losing it, uh, that would be ideal. The reality is, is a good portion of that loss is your water main breaks, which you're all very familiar with, I'm sure. The good news is there is you've set up a program uh, to do a lot of water main replacement and you're already starting to see reductions in water main breaks. Uh, presumably when this audit is done uh, in more recent times, you're gonna see that number dropping. For reference, the Lake Michigan supply community's target is around 10 to 12%. So again, you're a little bit above that, but over time uh, throughout the planning period with water main uh, replacement programs, uh, leak detection, et cetera, we think that that will continue to come down. Did what we did with the water main, the meters, is that affecting this number as well? Because yep. we so had this, a lot of loss. This number, as Jeff mentioned, is from 2014. We hope to see a reduction in the percentage based on a number of different measures that we've employed. Um, we've gone to fixing water main breaks as they're reported. Um, historically, sometimes they would run for 24 hours or so until a crew could get to them. So there's a lot of water loss. We're testing large commercial meters now for accuracy. We will be testing residential meters as well. <clears throat> We've implemented that new bulk water fill station, which should cut down on some theft and loss uh, through just reporting was on your honor system before. We are also doing a village-wide leak survey this year. So there's some some measures, multiple measures put in place to hopefully reduce that number. Thank you. Doug, one other thing, if you go just to the right of the circle, where you'll see it, apparent losses and underneath it is real losses. So what they've done now is your water losses are broken into two smaller buckets and the apparent losses would be um, where you have meters that don't register accurately. So you're not really losing that water, but you're not billing it out and it's not registering. So that's an estimate right now because we don't have detailed information on how accurate the meters are. One of the things that we're planning on doing is going, doing some random uh, replacement of residential meters and then testing those meters that we remove to determine the accuracy of them. 
And if what we find tells us that certain areas of the village have less accurate meters, we're going to target them for replacement. That's going to be our guide to help replace it so that apparent losses should start to come down. So that's one way to reduce that 23%. Then the one below that is real losses. So that's when actually water is going out of the mains and we're not accounting for it. That's like main breaks, uh, things like that. So that also can be uh, dealt with. One of the things that, uh, as Todd mentioned, that you know the system-wide leak detection, oftentimes, it's, well, I shouldn't say often, but it can happen that you can have a leak, um, let's say near a storm sewer or in a vein of sand and gravel, and it may not show up, and you can be losing water for a period of time and not know it. So. Um, the leak detection is a good way to, to make sure that you don't have any of that going on. So um, that's kind of the strength of this audit program is that it helps you kind of figure out where to look for uh, these things. And um, this is a, a program that the state of the Illinois EPA is promoting across the entire state for people to use and to try to get a better handle on their water system. Thank you. Okay, so we had the current trends, water use, and um, from there we wanted to define that green line that we talked about earlier, the less resource intensive. And the way that we did that was Water 2050, the Regional Water Supply Planning Group had established 13 water conservation best management practices. We evaluated uh, each of those, found the ones that we felt like made the most amount of sense for the village of Montgomery and then quantified the amount of uh, water conservation or water savings that could take place for each one of those components. Uh, this is just a summary. Uh, ultimately, the total gets down to be 21%. The biggest one of this list is the utility water system losses, again, at 10.3%. So that is your biggest bang for your buck. Uh, but also, some of these other best management practices will help you get down as much as 21% percent of your water use in the future. So when you apply the um, current trends all the way across, we get our average day, which is in blue here, this line. If you apply the 21 percent reduction, then the new line is the dotted line below that. If you use the peaking factors, then here's your max day, which is in green, at 6.62 for current trends and 4.54. Typically, when you have higher levels of water conservation, your peaking factor goes down because people are just thinking about conserving water and, and being more efficient about it. So we actually drop the peaking factor for you as well as all the other communities that we've done this for. And there has been evidence that's shown that that is, in fact, the case. Uh, the peak hour, then, is the red lines at 13.23 and 9. So Again, Stan, these are specific to Montgomery, whereas the previous chart was just meant to be very generalized. Next, then, is the regulatory review. Like I mentioned, uh, we went through all of the existing regulations. Your guys do a great job of running the system. And of course, um, right now, there are no violations that we're certainly aware of and have no reason to believe that there are any either. Uh, the one that I did highlight there is the lead and copper rule, uh, which is something that we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, later on, and it might be coming to mind a little bit related to Flint, Michigan. Uh, the village is in compliance with the lead and copper rule, uh, so you can be confident that the water you're putting out uh, meets that regulation, as well as all the other ones on this list. We had established the water use and now we need to determine what that means from a capacity perspective. Uh, we evaluate the capacity based on five test parameters, uh, which uh, we call together the needs assessment calculations. Two of those parameters focus on supply and treatment. Those are the two that are listed there, the ultimate source capacity and reliable source capacity. For a system of your size, reliable source capacity is the parameter that makes the most amount of sense. The chart to the right here shows uh, what your water, what your capacity was based on the previous demands or the historical demands. The blue bar is if the current trends water use was to continue, or actually the historical ones first, and then out into the future. The green bar is the less resource intensive. So first of all, 
uh, back to well number 15 was put online uh, between the end of 2011 and 2012 and if you see the graph here that's a good news because right at around 2011 you can't even see the blue bar so we're hovering right around the capacity uh, at that time with that addition we added um, a lot of capacity to the system water use actually went down from that point forward so you ended up having a little excess capacity in your system uh, out throughout this period. If we project forward then, you can see that the current trends goes negative somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people with an addition of people added to your system, whereas the LRI actually never goes negative. So at 2050, which is an addition of 14,500 people, you would need 1,300 gallons per minute of additional supply in the treatment to go along with it to meet the demands if the current trend water use were to continue. But if you get the water, man down, water demand down, if the community gets water demand down, more like the less resource intensive, you actually have the excess capacity of upwards of 800 gallons per minute and therefore no additional supply resources would be needed. For reference, a new well uh, the new um, Ironton Galesville well, for instance, if that's the approach that you would take, which is what you have with your last two wells, are about 1,000 gallons per minute. So the 1296 would need actually more than one well within your system to meet that future demand if, again, the demand continues with current trends. We had the three other test parameters that focus on storage. So the first ones were on supply, now looking at storage. Peak hour storage is the parameter that uh, fits the best, again, for your size of community. The good news here is, is historically, based on current trends, the blue bars are all positive, and actually out into the future, they're all positive as well. Uh, under the current trend scenario, you got about 0.7 million gallons of excess capacity in 2050. Under the LRI, you got uh, 1.3 million gallons of capacity, so no additional elevated tanks would actually be required within your system. Okay, so in northeastern Illinois, there's generally four sources of supply uh, that people can tap into. Not all four are available in every single community. It turns out for the village of Montgomery, they are all accessible. Whether or not they're cost effective is, is another story. But the four sources of supply generally are shale, sand, and gravel, wells, deep sandstone wells. Again, Village of Montgomery has both of these. Connection to Lake Michigan supply is an option. And then, of course, for Montgomery, the Fox River is an option, as well as some other communities up and down the Fox <coughs> River. Getting into then uh, how is water used across Northeast Illinois, or what is the source water? The chart to the right is a summary of that. It was completed by the Illinois State Water Survey. The areas in blue, this blue color, is Lake Michigan water. The areas in green, which you can see one here, is Elgin. That's inland surface water, so they actually use the Fox River here. In the light orange is shallow groundwater, and then the dark orange is the deep groundwater, deep sandstone. The hatched here is actually Aurora, who uses both inland surface water, the Fox River, as well as deep wells, and they actually use shallow wells also. Just to give you the perspective, here's where Montgomery sits on that map, of course, at the southeast corner of Kane and the northeast corner of Kendall. As you can see, most of the suburbs uh, western suburbs, outer suburbs rely on groundwater, some shallow, some deep. About 90 million gallons of water is being withdrawn from the Deke Aquifer across northern eastern Illinois right now. The Illinois State Water Survey estimate that that is two times the sustainable amount. So the groundwater, of course, gets recharged, and then you can pull pump out of that. Well, if you're pumping more, then water that's being recharged, the water levels will decline. And they estimate, again, in the deep aquifer system that we're pumping at a rate two times the amount that is being recharged in this area. We're going to take that and uh, talk a little bit about history. 
I have a question. Yes, sir. Can we go back to that previous? Thank you. If Montgomery is getting their water from uh, shallow and deep well, uh, well situations, this has got to be a concern for all of the suburbs and the western end of Chicago. And if they're all realizing this, they're all going to go. They're, they're, the Fox River goes through quite a few suburbs. So what happens when everyone starts tying into the Fox River? Are we depleting that resources and, and, and not able to s sustain that? We're going to get into that in, in a little bit. But one of the main things is, is when municipalities pull from the Fox River, they usually send it back, right? So all we're doing is recirculating someone's wastewater as it goes further and further down. Yep. And if you're on the Mississippi River it's and you're at the bottom of the Mississippi River, it's a really big number as to how much water's been recycled. But obviously with treatment systems, appropriate level of treatment, uh, the water is treated to the point where it's potable. And Elgin and Aurora, of course, do that. I'll take a drink of my water now. And there, Thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, there are communities out there that f flat out recycle water and don't dump it into a river and then suck it in a ways down, right? There are. I don't believe there's any in the United States that have gone basically that direct connect. Mm -hmm. Out west, a lot of times what they're doing is they'll do aquifer storage, so they'll send it into an aquifer and then they'll pull it back out. But you know, pulling from a surface water source and discharging to it and treating it has occurred for many decades. I'd like to point out that just a different way of looking at it, all water is a finite resource. So pretty much all water has been recycled at some point. The groundwater that we're pulling out of the aquifers may be recycled from prehistoric eras, whereas water being pulled out of Lake Michigan right at this moment may have left Milwaukee as waste, you know, a couple weeks ago. So it, the water's treated to a level where it's okay to drink. So again, I'm um, going to walk through quickly, I, I swear, um, <laughs> the history of the sources of water use uh, throughout Northeast Illinois, because I think a lot of times you use history to tell you uh, perhaps things that you don't want to do, but sometimes they can chart a path for you or tell you uh, opportunities or different ways of approaching things that uh, might make sense for you. So the first exhibit on the left here, color coding is exactly the same as it was previously. This is what it looked like in 1966. So Lake Michigan water in blue, uh, the dark orange is the deep sandstone, and then the light orange is the uh, shallow. So in 75, you start to see the movement of Lake Michigan water a little bit down here. Uh, it's coming out. Uh, as you look across this, you get kind of flip-flopping between shallow and deep. When you get to 1985, I realize it's a little hard to see on the screen here, but by then is when actually Elgin had tapped into the Fox River. You're starting to see Lake Michigan water migrate more uh, down in the southern area as well. When you get to 1991, now the Lake Michigan water went out to serve the folks in the NSM Jawa, which is the Schaumburg Hoffman Estates area. When we get to 1995 now, this is Aurora now that's on the Fox River as well. And actually DuPage Water Commission has uh, been created and Lake Michigan water is out into DuPage County. And then in 2007, uh, one of the biggest things is actually down here is when Wilmington, actually all the way back here, sorry, Wilmington went into the Kankakee River and then over here is when some Lake Michigan water came down, and this would be Plainfield on the far western end. This is 66, and then 2007. Again, you can see the migration of Lake Michigan water moving west. Now, because of that, that is a source of supply that we considered for the village of Montgomery, but you have to remember, the farther and farther you, away you get from Lake Michigan, the capacity of the system start to get used up. 
because when they were setting up these systems to pump to DuPage County, for instance, they set it up more or less to meet the demands of the folks in that community. To get it farther west, there's a question of whether there is additional capacity there. It turns out, actually, for DuPage County, there is because uh, overall their water use has declined. The spine that's coming down this way is a spine that we looked at for Yorkville, and unfortunately, there is an excess capacity in that spine for them. There is not? There is not. Okay. So in order for them to connect to Lake Michigan, they'd have to go back into that spine and do some pretty major improvements just to be able to get the capacity to pump the water out uh, to their community. Is the Lake Michigan water controlled by Chicago? Lake Michigan allocations, so how much water can be diverted, is permitted by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Chicago has two water treatment plants. One of them's at Navy Pier and one's farther south. Uh, many of the communities do get water from Chicago. Uh, some folks to the farther north, which we're gonna show you a slide in a little bit here that shows you where the intakes are, have their own withdrawals from the lake. Uh, so anywhere where you are connecting on coming from Chicago, they do control the water rate, of course. And then if you have somebody in between, they would have control over the water rate. And it's been progressively going up ever since. The water rates, yes. There right. has been some pretty significant increases in the last uh, five to ten years. Can you, we're just south, just south of Aurora there, right, on the 2007 map? Here, here. Right there, right? Yep. So is that Naperville-ish? Uh, yes. On Lake yes. Michigan? So Aurora, you know, there's obviously a portion of Aurora that comes down between Montgomery and Naperville. Um, but the Naperville is that westernmost they are. in our area. Now, the one thing to point out there is, is, you know, DuPage Water Commission has transmission mains, which are the larger diameter mains that are working around, you know, within the DuPage County then it enters the community's water systems, and from there they have their own pipes. So, you know, if you're gonna try to connect to DuPage Water Commission and you wanna go specifically to them, you have to get all the way to one of their transmission mains. If you wanted to try to work through another community like Naperville, you could do that, but then you've gotta work out an agreement with them, and then you've got your third subordinate, you're working through Naperville, who's working through DuPage Water Commission, who's working through the city of Chicago. And whether or not Naperville would have capacity at the end of their line, you know, is questionable as well because, of course, they set up their distribution system to serve the people within their community, not necessarily an adjacent one. It would concern me to depend upon the city of Chicago for anything, uh, quite honestly. Um, I wouldn't want the residents for the village to be held hostage to whatever and whoever feels like they can raise the rates. Um, I know that we've this board and, and including previous boards have uh, been very conservative on, on raising water rates so uh, that, that's my opinion. The expansion of the Lake Michigan water system is that driven by the depletion of the groundwater supply or? Yep and we're going to show you a nice okay. little animation uh, in a second that showed you kind of that exact thing. Okay, then um, again, because this is pretty important for some of the groundwater declines that we're going to talk about, let's talk about some of the hydrogeology in the area. I know when you're coming here tonight, that was probably on the front of your mind. Uh, first of all, the most shallow aquifer, and we're talking about hydrogeology, we're talking about uh, basically aquifers or groundwater. So shallow sand and gravel would be closest to the surface. It would be the uh, sand and gravel deposits that are right on top of the upper bedrock formation in this area is a limestone formation. Uh, going down from there, the first deep sandstone formation is the Ansel unit, the St. Peter that I mentioned earlier. In the Montgomery area, the depth to get to the top of the St. Peter is about 700 feet. The bottom of the St. Peter is around 900 feet. The next deep sandstone formation below that is what's called the Ironton Galesville formation. Uh, in this area, in the Montgomery area, the top of that would be about 1,000 feet deep, and the bottom would be 1,300 feet deep. There is yet another sandstone formation even deeper, uh, which is called the Mount Simon formation. 
when we look at the Mount Simon, we really need to look at this axis over here. Here's sea level, zero, and if you strike that line across in the Montgomery area, we are hundreds to over a thousand feet below mean sea level. And when people tap into the Mount Simon down in this area, and it actually occurred in DuPage County, you start to get some brackish water. So you're so far below mean sea level that you're starting to get some saltwater intrusion, and ultimately the water quality of the Mount Simon in this area of Northeast Illinois really isn't an option. There are other portions of Northeast Illinois where it is, in fact, um, South Elgin has two Mount Simon wells in place. Uh, Hampshire has one as well. So they can use it up farther north in Kane County, but just down here can't. So the three sandstone formations we talked about, again, St. Peter, Ironton, Galesville, and Mount Simon, that makes up what's called the Cambrian Ordovician Aquifer System, uh, which we're going to get into in a second. Uh, Cambrian Ordovician are just geologic periods of time. So Montgomery is actually one of the more diverse communities as far as your water supply portfolio. You actually have wells that go into the shallow sand and gravel. You have a well, a couple wells that go into the lime, shallow limestone. And then you have one, two wells that go into the St. Peter, or actually three of them, St. Peter and Ironton Galesville, and then one that's open just to the Ironton Galesville. We're gonna focus again on this Cambrian Ordovician system uh, even more in a second. So shallow sand and gravel. So that was Northeast Illinois. That was the very general introduction. If we now drill down to the village of Montgomery and what's really available for long-term use for the village of Montgomery, taking one at a time, talk about shallow sand and gravel first. The Illinois State Water Survey was a project partner. A lot of the exhibits they provided, including this one, uh, were from their work. The Illinois State Geological Survey has created a three-dimensional model of the geology below the surface in Kane, Kendall, uh, McHenry, the surrounding counties across the area. In fact, they've even extended it uh, out to states adjacent to us. Locally, we worked with them to pull out of their database the shallow sand and gravel deposits in the Montgomery planning area and surrounding area to see if there is posits of reasonable thickness that the village could tap into and have a sustainable shallow well. On this map, we're generally looking for the pinkish color uh, because there you're looking at about 75 to 100 feet of sand and gravel thickness. Uh, the darker blue is starting to get where it's pretty marginal that there's thick enough uh, sand and gravel deposits. If you look across Montgomery's planning area, unfortunately you don't see much dark blue or pink. The pink up in this area is actually Sugar Grove, and Sugar Grove does have a shallow well uh, that's tapped into the aquifer up there. The pink over in this area is Plano, and they have several, several shallow wells there too. So while the village has a couple sand and gravel wells, the pumping rate of those wells is generally low. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't sufficient sand and gravel deposits across any other portions of your planning area to depend on the shallow sand and gravel formations as a long-term sustainable supply source. Talking about deep sandstone aquifer in the Montgomery and sound surrounding area uh, in northeast Illinois as well. This is a depiction of the Cambrian Ordovician aquifer system. So like I mentioned, St. Peter, Ironton Galesville, and Mount Simon working together in one overall aquifer system. It spreads across seven states. Uh, Illinois, of course, here on the exhibit, and then Northeast Illinois uh, in red, spreads out to Iowa, uh, out to Missouri, up into Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, uh, even into Minnesota. Now the one main thing to point about, point out about this exhibit is while the aquifer is underneath us, there's many layers of bedrock above those sand and gravel, sandstone formations such that when it rains in Montgomery, that water actually can't get into the deep aquifer. There's what's called aquitards that don't allow the water to directly go down. As you go farther west into the north, the sandstone gets closer to the surface and it doesn't have those bedrock formations above it. In fact, if you go out towards Newark, um, the sandstone is the first bedrock formation, so when it rains out there, it does. 
point being is, is we're depending on the recharge area out here for water to come into the aquifer and transfer that water through into this area. Uh, and then we pull from that aquifer. So when we draw water levels down, it takes a fair amount of time for it to recharge and actually fill in and bring water levels back up in this area. Okay, so Stan, this is getting to your question a little bit earlier. I'm going to do a little bit setup, and then we're going to let this animation go. Uh, those deep sandstone aquifers have been tapped for almost 150 years, which is pretty impressive that 150 years ago they were drilling wells that were 1,000 feet deep. Uh, it took them a long time, but they eventually got there. Back actually in Cook County, those sandstone aquifers were artesian wells. So all you had to do was poke a hole down in the aquifer and the water would actually flow out of the hole. That's not the case anymore based on the water level declines. What you'll see with the animation, and it starts in 1959 and steps forward, is in the 1970s there was a major cone of depression centered around Elmhurst, which would be of course in DuPage County here, the eastern end of DuPage County. Then when you get to the 80s and 90s, as we showed on some of those previous exhibits, Lake Michigan water's moving west. So the communities in DuPage County and surrounding areas are going off of the aquifer, so you actually start to see the water levels come up to the point where there's decent recovery in some areas into the early 2000s. But as water declines continue, uh, and then I'll pop Montgomery on here, down in the northern portion of Will County, northern and central portion, you start to see a major Kona depression continue to develop uh, in that area, which ultimately span, spans out to affect Montgomery and the surrounding areas. So go ahead and hit fast forward, or <laughs> not fast forward, uh, go on that. So right now we've got a contour of, eight, of 600 feet of drawdown, and you're seeing that this major contour all the way around here of uh, water level declines at some point here up in this area, you're going to see as much as 800 feet of drawdown. Again, this is in the 80s when there's just a lot of pumping out of that deep aquifer system. Pretty soon here, now the Lake Michigan water is going to start pushing forward. See how there's major declines down here too. You start seeing these contours move in, so the declines are less. You're seeing a lot of recovery occur up in DuPage County. And there was a little bit of recovery down in here, but eventually that starts to span out again. So when you get to, you know, pretty much now in 2014, you've got a major cone of depression down in this area of Will County, which emanates out to uh, the Montgomery area and certainly your neighbors around it too. Is that area referencing Joliet? So this is just a quick summary then of what you saw. Um, the exhibits here show the area of partial to complete desaturation. On here you've got uh, the three communities that we looked at for the subregion planning boundaries. So blue is Montgomery here. This is Yorkville. This is Oswego. So today you're already seeing some desaturation in the aquifer. When the Illinois State Water Survey projects out to 2050, for continuing water use, if we continue it based on the current trends, then you see portions that are completely desaturated. A little hard to see, but the dark orange here actually goes up into the Oswego area and touches on the village of Montgomery. So they did all this modeling regionally, and essentially we're applying the water demand across all the existing wells. Well, we know that if your water demand goes up, you're going to put in new wells to accomplish that at least for the current trend scenario. And then your neighbors, if their water demand goes up, they're going to put in new wells too. So we wanted to evaluate locally then what that means for water level declines. Uh, just to be consistent with their regional modeling, we first did the five wells and your specific current trends for you uh, to see what water levels look like. Then we put in uh, the current trends that we had established for 2050 plus two new wells, so well 16 here and well 17 out there to see how that might affect water level declines by spacing out withdrawals from that aquifer. Can it make a big difference? And then after that, we put in the LRI 
And since we didn't need any additional wells, we applied those back to the five existing to see what the water levels look like. These charts on the right summarize that analysis, uh, the 2050 analysis. We did it two ways. We did it if Joliet remains on the deep aquifer, like we just showed and talked about, they withdraw from the deep aquifer too. Uh, back um, a couple decades ago, Joliet strongly considered switching from deep aquifer over to a surface supply, uh, namely the Kankakee River. Uh, at that point, they ultimately decided not to move forward with that and to proceed and continue to pull from the deep aquifer. So we did run some other runs where Joliet, if they did go to surface water supply, what might it look like up here? Might it actually uh, allow the water levels to um, increase back to levels that are reasonable and might it be sustainable? So we'll go through that in a second. But we have current trends on the left and less resource intensive. This is additional drawdown from today. And if you can see it on your handout, we're seeing numbers that are on the order of 250 feet of additional drawdown from today if the 20, um, 50 water use projections for current trends. There's a red line on here, which is the Yorkville planning area. Montgomery would be up in here, which is the blue line. So you don't actually see a 250 foot drawdown contour in the LRI. So one would think we're pulling less from the aquifer, therefore it doesn't draw down as much, which is certainly good news. This is where the 200 foot contour is. So for current trends, it's a pretty good size area. Uh, for the village, for the less resource intensive, it's, it's a lot smaller, but there certainly still is areas where it's 200. One thing I want to point out, and I won't go into a great level of detail, there is a fault. There's the Sandwich Fault that runs across the southern portion of Yorkville's planning area. The challenge there is, is the aquifers actually don't line up. So remember how we talked about bringing water from the west and coming into this area? It can't pass through this fault. So it limits, there's a boundary there, it limits how much water can actually recharge into your specific area. Farther north, you know, that fault is much farther west and it doesn't affect them as much because they get to points where water can recharge from the surface. But down in this area, and it transfers all the way down in the Joliet area, that is a major geological uh, characteristic that affects things. <coughs> Jeff, can I just ask one question? Sure. So kind of based on that, any, and I'm not, that familiar with how they recharge. But any surface water that's on the west side of that fault that hits will never make it to recharge in, for our portion of the aquifer because of the fault. Correct. Now, this goes up. I mean, it originates in Sandwich, hence the name Sandwich Fault. So there are portions as you get a little bit farther west mm -hmm. of Montgomery where it can recharge, but then it gets to a point where essentially the water is more or less going west rather than east. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's the 150 foot drawdown between the two, still pretty significant. So like I said, ran the scenarios with Joliet switching to surface water. And while there certainly is improvement, unfortunately we still see some pretty significant drawdowns. So under the current trends, we don't see 250 feet of drawdown anymore, but there's still 200 feet that's spreading across a good portion of the subregion. When we look at the 150 contour, comparing you know top to bottom, again, it's certainly less, but it's still a pretty good area. Uh, the LRI certainly gets better under that scenario as well. If Joliet were to switch, you know they do see a lot of water level. Um, recovery within their area, and, and that actually spreads pretty far west. So the southeast corner of Yorkville's planning area is down in here, and what this shows is, is the water levels in 2014 would be about the same as they are in 2015 to that point. They would actually see spots where the water levels would be even higher than what they are today, or down in that area, the water level would be even higher. But the fact of the matter is, is that if the withdrawal from the deep aquifer system occurs as it is today with the same type of pattern moving forward and drilling more wells and pulling from the aquifer in this area, there is a high enough demand in this area that it just cannot recharge, recharge enough to make it sustainable. Getting into specifics then, what does it look like in one of the villages wells? So we pulled out well number three uh, just to show you, 
This is the water level in the well over time. So it starts in 1960. The open circles here are the historical level. So back in 1960, uh, the water level was around 300 feet. Today, around 2010-ish, 2015-ish, it's about 100 feet. So over that time period, water levels have dropped about 200 feet within well number three. The Illinois State Water Survey used their model to project the water levels forward into the future under the current trends in LRI. So those are the different colors on that graph. That would be if the wells weren't pumping. When a well turns on, the water within that well has to drop to be able to pull water in from the aquifer. So we struck another line on this graph, which is this one down here. So when the well turns on, that's what the pumping water level would look like in well number three. The other key components on these graphs is up here is that St. Peter sandstone formation, top and bottom, and then down here is the Ironton Galesville. So out into 2050, a good portion of the St. Peter sandstone would be dewatered, even from just a static perspective. Even now, when you turn well number three, you're actually pulling the water levels below the St. Peter, and over time, you start to get to the point where it's uh, getting closer to the top of the Ironton Galesville. Why is this important? Well, number one, there's water in the aquifers now, and there would be water in the wells out probably to 2050. But at some point, if the aquifer continues to be pumped at this unsustainable rate, the water levels decline, and the aquifer is totally depleted, then you don't have that source at all anymore. If, however, you can switch to another source of water and utilize the capacity of the aquifer that's there as your backup supply, you already have a lot of investment in wells into that aquifer system. There's certainly capacity there today, and wouldn't it be great if you're able to use the water that's there now? The longer and longer you continue to pump from that aquifer, the more the water levels decline and the less uh, that you will have, at, at the less you'll be able to use those aquifers as your backup source of supply. Uh, this is just when Joliet goes off, so I'm not going to go through as much detail as before, but ultimately there is some recovery again, but unfortunately it's not really that significant when you think about it, and we had just talked about that being that just based on the local withdrawals from the aquifer, uh, it doesn't really matter too much what Joliet would do. Um, it won't, unfortunately, solve the source water concerns with the deep sandstone formation in this area. A few other things to point out that would be challenges if the water level in the deep aquifer were to continue to decline. This schematic shows uh, this would be, let's just say now, if the well was pumping from that St. Peter sandstone, it might look a little bit like this. The water level inside the well pulls down. There's going to be other people in the area that are pulling from their aquifer. There certainly are, whether it be a residential house or actually some industries uh, within the Montgomery planning area. There is at least one industry in the Montgomery planning area that pulls from the deep aquifer system. If water levels continue to decline, it's quite possible that you could dewater some of those wells, which would certainly have an effect on them. The lower water levels in the wells will require a higher amount of energy. So as the water levels go down, you need more horsepower to bring that water to the surface. So your energy costs certainly go up over time. The flow rate is likely to decline because the casing diameter, at some point there's only a certain size motor that you can put in there. And then with the water level declines, instead of it being a 1,000 gallon per minute well today, in the future it could be 600 gallon per minute. Well, if it dropped down to 600, now we need another well to take over the capacity that it originally provided at 1,000. Once you start dewatering aquifers, unfortunately there can be some water quality ramifications. Up in Wisconsin, they have seen situations where the St. Peter has started to water and there's been arsenic release. If that were to occur, there hasn't been any documentation of that that we're aware of in Northeast Illinois yet, but if you start getting different water quality issues by dewatering these aquifers, it could force additional treatment, and therefore there's additional cost associated with that. And then as, we, as I mentioned in the previous slide, 
you know, you have the investment in this aquifer, there is still some capacity, so it would be great to be able to use it as a backup source of water when your alternate source may not be available. If you pump it all the way down to the point where it cannot recharge, then you won't have it there as a backup source of supply. It's, it seems like uh, a big consideration is Joliet, the way the last few graphs you've shown. Now, I, I know they went into everybody's back door, Plainfield especially, and went within a mile of their downtown, because they would take their water all over the place, and they're now in around Oswego, Naperville, all around. Uh, but it seems like a lot of the water levels might really show what they do, right, basically? That, we saw the cone of depression in the Joliet area, um, certainly when they're pumping, which is these upper ones. Mm -hmm. But what the lower graphs were showing was while they get a lot of recovery in the Joliet area, which is down in this area of the graph, still within your subregion, you're still going to have a lot of declines. So it helps, but unfortunately, it won't solve it. Well, thank you. Okay, next one, uh, hitting three out of four here, and then we'll get to the Fox River in a second. So going through Lake Michigan water, we've talked about that quite a bit. Um, this graphic, again, provided by the Illinois State Water Survey, just shows how Lake Michigan water is distributed from the lake and out to the west. On the right-hand side, you have all the triangles, red triangles. These are the intakes into the lake. So, you know, here's the two for the city of Chicago, and then the folks on the North Shore, there are many communities that have their own individual intake. Coming out then, the spider shows how the water is just generally distributed. So here, for instance, is your DePage Water Commission, and that is getting water from the city of Chicago that's obviously getting it uh, from the lake. Because the DePage Water Commission is the closest Lake Michigan supply to the village of Montgomery, that's the system that we spoke to to determine if it is a viable option for the village. Uh, Pete was able to talk directly with uh, DePage Water Commission staff about the connection consideration. This is just a summary of uh, some of the considerations. First, the Commission's current policy is, is that DePage Water Commission users would be wholly DePage Water Commission water users, meaning you couldn't use wells part of the time or for a portion of your demand in DePage Water Commission another portion. However, they're considering changing that. So that could be a benefit to somebody like Montgomery that, again, has a pretty significant investment in uh, their, their source, their supply, and their treatment. The commission, though, another, I guess, positive is, is the commission is going to pay off their construction bonds in the next one to two years. However, everybody in the DuPage Water Commission helped pay them off. So, and then part of that actually was sales tax that was applied within the DuPage County to help pay them off. If a new community were to connect onto that system, they're going to charge that community a connection fee basically for all that investment that was put in place to start with. Using your 2014 average data man of 2.5 MGD, that would be about a $9 million just for buying capacity in their system. If you're looking out to 2050 and buying that full capacity, it would be $13.7 million. So again, that's just capacity in their system. On top of that, you would also need to run a transmission main from somewhere within the DuPage system out to Montgomery, and then from there, likely you would have some water distribution improvements to transfer it across your system, most likely from east to west. The other thing, as we talked about earlier, is DuPage Water Commission's rate are established by the city of Chicago, so you certainly lose control relative to your water rate development. Lastly, then, getting into the Fox River. The Illinois State Water Survey, in addition to having groundwater model, has the Illinois Stream Assessment model, where they model flows in the Fox River. The model includes all the natural inputs, so that would be tributaries that come into the Fox River. It would also include the groundwater inputs, shallow groundwater is going to recharge into 
uh, the Fox River, but then it includes the man-made inputs too. So the man-made inputs, as we've already talked about, would be wastewater treatment facilities, for instance. This model takes into account all the way up into Wisconsin, Milwaukee area, and it actually took Waukesha out of the calculation because they're talking about getting Lake Michigan water. So it is, in fact, pretty conservative in that way. One uh, parameter that we really need to talk about here is what's called the Q710. It's a statistical flow, the lowest flow in a seven-day period that would occur one in 10, day, 10 years. Sorry. Uh, the state, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, if you were to get a withdrawal permit from them, they're going to have a protected low flow. And basically what it would say is, is you can withdraw from the river as long as the flow is above this level. When the flow goes below that level, you can no longer withdraw because there's other uses of the Fox River um, that are there, you know, natural uses, let's just say, fish, other things within the Fox River that they are going to maintain a certain base flow for them. So that's the period of time where you would be needing the backup supply, which we're going to get into in a second. The lowest flows in the Fox River typically occur in September, which is actually a good thing because typically your peak water use is in July or August, so they don't fully align, which helps from the risk of the water levels in the Fox River going below that protected low flow in the times when you really need uh, extra water. Um, the graphs to the right then are simulations that were done in the model. So this upper one focuses on um, the Montgomery withdrawal and what it might look like. The blue line is the current Q710 flow in the Fox River. So that would be today what the flow would look like because many communities across Northeast Illinois, even up into Wisconsin, are pulling from that deep aquifer, and it normally wouldn't get to the Fox River because it's so deep, but they're bringing it to the surface, they're sending it to homes, industries, commercial folks within their community, discharging it from their wastewater treatment facility. The base flow on the Fox River is projected to actually go up. There's gonna be these additional sources in the river. So in the future, the orange line here shows that the level will go up. A few points, other points to uh, point out here. This is Elgin, so you can see their withdrawal. They have three wastewater treatment facilities that they send their wastewater to, and it returns it to the Fox River, which is the water levels coming up here. This point is Aurora's withdrawal here, and then its return at Fox Metro on the back end. When we evaluated Montgomery's withdrawal, obviously it's between Aurora and upstream of Fox Metro for your particular withdrawal, so that's that little blip uh, right here. The good news is, again, the orange line is above the blue line. So if the village was to do a withdrawal either by yourself or the line down here actually is if it's sub-regional, and if the low flow was established as the current Q710, Flows are generally going to go up, and the risk of going below the Q710 goes down. This then again is, is if the sub-regional approach were to occur, and a withdrawal somewhere in the area of the Orchard Road Fox River intersection is here, and again you can see even with the sub-regional approach that the water uh, levels are expected, or flow rates are expected to be higher in the future. The of course. Table, I'm, yes, sir. So if so if on these low flow times, we would re revert back to the deep aquifer? Yes. You just flip and the switch? Yes. I mean, it, sim oversimplifying it, but it's, it's not overly complicated to make that transition? Nope. In fact, so um, both Aurora and Elgin do have deep wells that are connected to their system. Um, Elgin usually uses 90 to 95% Fox River water and only turns on their deep wells when they really need to, whether it's a water quality issue uh, or if they you know, need from a temperature sometimes. Aurora is almost always has some wells on within their system uh, and the type of treatment system that we're proposing here uh, for this process can treat either and put out the same level of water quality on the back end of that plant. Thank you. My question is with regard to the dams. Do the, 
Does the presence or the absence of dams affect the Q710? It does not. <coughs> While the dams affect water levels, they don't affect flow rate. Okay. Because the water coming in behind it is still going to pass over top of it and continue down. There just isn't enough storage behind those dams to really affect the flow. What about DNR up in uh, McHenry? So they the stop Stratton. everything. <laughs> the Stratton Dam, of course, controls uh, flows out of the chain of lakes. And uh, they control that. They manage that to manage water levels within the chain of lakes. They do have a policy in place to keep water flowing down the river, again, because of all the other uses down the river. So I really don't see a circumstance where they would shut off Elgin, Aurora, and all the other uses downstream for recreational purposes upstream in the chain of lakes. But it does go down when their water level goes down and those big boats want water. You have less water flow going to Elgin. And, and that's all part of this calculation with the Q710 because they look at the historical flows and factor all that in. All right. The tables on the right here are meant to illustrate uh, the reduction in risk over time relative to the Q710 as it sits today. So the upper table gives you the percent risk in any given uh, year in May, or let's just go down to September, for instance, that the water, water the flow rate in the Fox River would be below the Q710. So today it's 4.7% chance that in any given year in September it would drop below. But because the water flow rate is going to go up into 2050, the 4.7 percent risk actually drops down below one. The table down here focuses on the four worst drought years. Uh, the first column shows the number of consecutive days that the flow in the river was below the current Q710. So in 1934, uh, one of the Dust Bowl years, there was a 98-day period of time when the water, when the flow rate was below the Q710. But if we look out to 2050, based on the increase, that drops down to only one day. In 2005, not too long ago, there was actually 50 days that uh, consecutive deficit days that were below the Q710. If we look out to 2050, there's 22. So based on all that and kind of combining it together, in summary, we believe that the Fox River is the most sustainable supply source within the subregion, considering the challenges with the others. However, a backup supply is still needed. It would, be, it would seem it would be in a community's best interest to do the withdrawal permitting sooner rather than later. So again, today, the Q710 level is set at a certain level of historical review. 20 years from now, if you redo the historical analysis, because the flow rate's going to go up, that Q710 is going to be higher. So then your increment between where the water levels are to where that Q710 gets less. Therefore, if you can go in, you can get a withdrawal permit now. You end up getting a protected low flow that's consistent with the current Q710 out into the future, you'll have a bigger increment to work with, assuming they don't reevaluate the Q710. Then, yeah, that's the elephant in the room. They could decide to change that, and all of these numbers are gone. Just like the Stratton Dam. They <laughs> Something could change down the road, and they could decide that, you know what, we really want our boats. <laughs> and they could stop the flow coming down river. They could. I would think public health and water supply would tend to rank a little bit higher, but, you know, obviously you could debate that with me. Um, the one thing to point out, actually, is Elgin and Aurora are grandfathered. So they don't even have a protected low flow in their permit. <coughs> they are able to withdraw. Um, and that's because, again, I think the importance of, and everybody knows that from a water supply, it's just critical for a community, it's critical for public health. So I don't see that from a regulatory perspective, them, you know, moving around to creating a, a big hardship. This could be one of the reasons, quite frankly, why going in as a subregion might be a benefit. So if you've got a withdrawal permit for Montgomery and Montgomery only, 
that might mean something. But if you have it for three communities together that's 190,000 people strong in 2050, that might mean something different. And again, getting in early. Right now, it's Elgin and Aurora are the, the two Fox. primary users on the Fox. Yes. So getting in early is a bigger benefit. I would think so. Since they're... Good question. We have not had that discussion with them. Uh, I don't know that they normally would establish a time frame for that. I mean, once you get the permit and show that you're going to do it, um, I believe that, you know, it would have, uh, you'd have whatever time you need. It might be a point where they would perhaps look at expiring it and then you would have to re-up it. But we haven't got into that level of detail with them. Again, with Elgin and Aurora, it was a little bit different. The regulatory climate's a little bit different now. So we, that would be one of the steps, next steps from this process. Not that we're aware of, no. Are there other communities doing and having this conversation About other the than the three in the region? About the Fox River? Correct. Not that we're aware of. Um, <clears throat> back, I don't know, five to ten years ago, Batavia and Geneva were considering it. Uh, they chose not to proceed. Uh, we're actually working on Batavia's master plan right now, and we are not looking at the Fox River for them at this point, just because that's not something that they, they plan to do. Um, we don't believe either of the other two tri-cities are. As you progress you know, further north, South Elgin, we don't believe is. Um, Algonquin, we don't believe is. So we think that you might be the only one at this time. And geographically, they're in a little bit better position because they can go to the deeper aquifer and not have a water quality problem like Farther we would. North is definitely better, exactly, as those exhibits show. So, okay, so they may have a, an option that we don't have. And they also have well over the water. Is there an appreciable percent of stormwater that does not go into the Fox? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, certainly there is going to be portions that percolate through uh, and then get into the shallow groundwater. That might even get into some receiving streams that ultimately get to the Fox River. Uh, in urbanized <coughs> area where there's more impervious area, uh, there would be less that gets into the Fox River because it's, well, actually that's not true. There would be more because it's running off and going into uh, storm sewers. Um, out in farm fields, a certain amount of that water will go into the ground and may not get there, but ultimately a, quite a bit of it does. I'm not sure if you're going to cover this in the next portion. Where does the Fox Metro facility fit into all this? Because they're doing an expansion now as well. Um, so they would just uh, continue to discharge into the Fox River. Um, you know, again, there's already a fair amount of discharge in the Fox River. In fact, during low flow periods, a good portion of the flow in the Fox River would be wastewater plants, whether it be Fox Metro, Forward, which is all the Elgin plants, Algonquin, Geneva, Batavia, St. Charles, all that. So with them, you know, yes, there's going to be an increase in discharge because they're expanding there but you will have the treatment system in place to be able to handle that water. So we would have to have a separate treatment facility, whether it's just Montgomery or if we go in with the other communities, we would still have to have something separate and then Fox Metro would operate separately as well. Exactly. Fox Metro is handling wastewater, so we're going to be handling drinking water, but, but Fox Metro will just operate the same way they're operating now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So then in summary, um, talking about Fox River water supply options, there's basically three options. So Fox River is the most sustainable. Uh, option number 
or option A relative to Fox River Supply would be uh, connecting to the city of Aurora. So Aurora, again, they pull from the Fox River. Potentially, you could connect to them, and we did have a conversation with them about that, which I'll summarize in a sec second. Option B would be Montgomery going to the river on your own. So you cite an intake, which we generally cited just south of Ashland Avenue, upstream of the dam, uh, near your well number 11. Uh, could be a location where you could put in an intake and you would bring it to your lime softening water treatment plant that you currently have on Nell Road. Option C is going together with your neighbors as a subregion and pulling from the Fox River along with Yorkville and Oswego. As I mentioned, uh, we sat down with the city of Aurora in the fall of last year to talk about the potential of connecting to their system. Uh, basically, while they have a little bit of excess capacity now, uh, they indicated that they had not really planned for uh, distributing water uh, to the village of Montgomery. So ultimately, it was determined that that's not a viable option for the village at this time. So we basically take that one off uh, for consideration. So then, in summary of all of the sources for the village of Montgomery, we show that there's not sufficient sand and gravel deposits within the Montgomery area to be sustainable long term. Lake Michigan water, while it would be sustainable, it's just too expensive to be able to get to the village of Montgomery and you lose a lot of control relative to setting water rates. The deep aquifer, unfortunately, has some pretty serious sustainability concerns as well. The Fox River is the most sustainable source. And with that, the one option is the village of Montgomery pulls from the Fox by yourself or you work with the other three communities and pull from the Fox River together. Taking those two overall sustainable source water options, we put together these three alternatives. Alternate one said, well, yes, the deep aquifer is not uh, sustainable long term or we have concerns or maybe things are going to change population is going to grow as we think it is I don't know there probably could be a way to talk through talk that through what if we just continued drilling deep wells putting in cation exchange water treatment plants what would the cost be we ran those numbers for current trends water use and for less resource intensive so that's 1a and 1b alternate two is what if the village of Montgomery goes to the Fox River themselves, put in that intake, bring that water to the lime softening treatment plant? 2A is the current trends, and 2B is the LRI. Alternate three is if you join with your neighbors and you do the subregional approach, pull from the Fox River, you treat it, and then the water has to be transmitted to all three of the communities. And we're going to get into that one in a little bit more detail in a few slides. So I promised they would offer up the opportunity for a break. <laughs> question Sorry. first. I have a question. So this LRI option, I saw low flow toilets and some of those things highlighted. Is that something that we're talking about we would require people to retrofit in or for new construction? We would change policies for new construction or we would require current trends to change? We wanted to, if the board said, you know, we want to move towards the low resource intensive future, what we would do is devise a plan to try to, to implement that. And it might include um, a incentive program for people to swap out old plumbing. So like if you have a house that was built before 1994, you might have a three or a five gallon per flush toilet. Maybe we set up some sort of a rebate program to help people uh, go to Home Depot and switch out a toilet. Um, if it's new construction, I think we would recommend that we change our ordinance to require the low flow. The, 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 the requirement now, I think, is 1.6 gallons per flush, but they have toilets that are w more efficient than that even, and we could encourage that. So you could, every step of the way, you could try to find strategies and programs that would help encourage people to do um, that sort of conservation. 
Um, the other thing that we'd want to do is really target uh, water loss in our water mains and, you know, develop a program for that. So I think it'd be like a multifaceted program that we would d develop and follow through over a period of time. Um, and it could have a lot of different uh, ways to accomplish that. Okay. Thank you. One more. We have two creeks that present watershed problems for us. Do either one of those have the potential to kind of solve two problems with one? Unfortunately, the base flow, and I'm assuming you're talking about Blackberry and Wabansi, yeah. the base flow in either one of those isn't sufficient based on the amount of water that you would need. So, you know, they too would be subject to protected low flow levels in the Q710 relative to them. And just based on the amount of demand for the village of Montgomery versus the base flow in those creeks, there's just not yeah, enough capacity. You can picture that versus the Fox River. You know, it's pretty significant as far as how much water's in there. We're gonna take a break. All right. Break. Let's take a break. And we'll continue after that. Five or ten minutes. Stretch, debrief. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> 